The Industrialization of the Mind, a critical essay by Hans Magnus Enzensberger, read by Steady Delta. All of us, no matter how irresolute we are, like to think that we reign supreme in our own consciousness, that we are masters of what our minds accept or reject. Since the soul is not much mentioned anymore, except by priests, poets, and pop musicians, the last refuge a man can take from the catastrophic world at large seems to be his own mind. Where else can he expect to withstand the daily siege, if not within himself? Even under the conditions of totalitarian rule, where no one can fancy any more that his home is his castle, the mind of the individual is considered a kind of last citadel and hotly defended, though this imaginary fortress may have been long since taken over by an ingenious enemy. No illusion is more stubbornly upheld than the sovereignty of the mind. It is a good example of the impact of philosophy on people who ignore it. For the idea that men can make up their own minds, individually and by themselves, is essentially derived from the tenets of bourgeois philosophy, second-hand Descartes, run-down Husserl, armchair idealism, and all it amounts to is a sort of metaphysical do-it-yourself. We might do worse, I think, than dust off the admirably laconic statement that one of our classics, made more than a century ago, what is going on in our minds has always been and will always be a product of society. This is a comparatively recent insight, though it is valid for all human history ever since the division of labor came into being. It could not be formulated before the time of Karl Marx. In a society where communication was largely oral, the dependence of the pupil on the teacher, the disciple on the master, the flock on the priest was taken for granted. That the few thought and judged and decided for the many was a matter of course, and not a matter for investigation. Medieval man was probably other directed to an extent than our sociology would be at a loss to fathom. His mind was, to an enormous degree, fashioned and processed from without, but the business of teaching and of indoctrination was perfectly straightforward and transparent. So transparent, indeed, that it became invisible as a problem, only when the processes that shape our minds became opaque, enigmatic, inscrutable for the common man. Only with the advent of industrialization did the question of how our minds are shaped arise in earnest. The mind-making industry is really a product of the last hundred years. It has developed at such a pace and assumed such varied forms that it has outgrown our understanding and our control. Our current discussion of the media seems to suffer from severe theoretical limitations. Newsprint, films, television, public relations tend to be evaluated separately in terms of their specific technologies, conditions, and possibilities. Every new branch of the industry starts off a new crop of theories. Hardly anyone seems to be aware of the phenomenon as a whole, the industrialization of the human mind. This is a process that cannot be understood by a mere examination of its machinery. Equally inadequate is the term cultural industry, which has become common usage in Europe since World War II. It reflects more than the scope of the phenomenon itself, the social status of those who have tried to analyze it, university professors and academic writers, people whom the power elite has relegated to the narrow confines of what passes as cultural life and who consequently have resigned themselves to bear the unfortunate label, cultural critics. In other words, they are certified as harmless. They are supposed to think in terms of culture and not in terms of power. Yet the vague and insufficient label cultural industry serves to remind us of a paradox inherent in all media work. Consciousness, however false, can be induced and reproduced by industrial means, but it cannot be industrially produced. It is a social product made up by people. Its origin is the dialogue. No industrial process can replace the persons who generate it, and it is precisely this truism of which the archaic term culture tries, however vainly, to remind us. The mind industry is monstrous and difficult to understand because it does not, strictly speaking, produce anything. It is an intermediary engaged only in production's secondary and tertiary derivatives,
in transmission and infiltration, in the fungible aspect of what it multiplies and delivers to the customer. The mind industry can take on anything, digest it, reproduce it, and pour it out. Whatever our minds can conceive of is grist to the mill. Nothing will leave it unadulterated. It is capable of turning any idea into a slogan and any work of the imagination into a hit. This is its overwhelming power, yet it is also its most vulnerable spot. It thrives on a stuff it cannot manufacture by itself. It depends on the very substance it must fear most and must suppress what it feeds on, the creative productivity of people. Hence, the ambiguity of the term cultural industry, which takes at face value the claims of culture in the ancient sense of the word and the claims of an industrial process that has all but eaten it up. To insist on these claims would be naive. To criticize the industry from the vantage point of a liberal education and to raise comfortable outcries against its vulgarity will neither change it nor revive the dead souls of culture. It will merely help to fortify the ghettos of educational programs and to fill the backward highbrow section of the Sunday papers. At the same time, the indictment of the mind industry on purely aesthetic grounds will tend to obscure its larger social and political meaning. On the other extreme, we find the ideological critics of the mind industry. Their attention is usually limited to its role as an instrument of straightforward or hidden political propaganda, and from the messages reproduced by it, they try to distill the political content. More often than not, the underlying understanding of politics is extremely narrow, as if it were just a matter of taking sides in everyday contests of power. Just as in the case of the cultural critic, this attitude cannot hope to catch up with the far-reaching effects of the industrialization of the mind, since it is a process that will abolish the distinction between private and public consciousness. Thus, while radio, cinema, television, recording, advertising, and public relations, new techniques of manipulation and propaganda are being keenly discussed, each on its own terms. The mind industry taken as a whole is disregarded. Newspaper and book publishing, its oldest and in many respects still its most interesting branch, hardly comes up for serious comment any longer, presumably because it lacks the appeal of technological novelty. Yet much of the analysis provided in Balzac's Illusion Perdue is as pertinent today as it was a hundred years ago as any copywriter from Hollywood who happens to be familiar with the book will testify. Other, more recent branches of industry still remain largely unexplored. Fashion and industrial design, the propagation of established religions and of esoteric cults, opinion polls, simulation, and last but not least, tourism, which can be considered a mass medium in its own right. Above all, however, we are not sufficiently aware of the fact that the full deployment of the mind industry still lies ahead. Up to now, it has not managed to seize control of its most essential sphere, education. The industrialization of instruction on all levels has barely begun. While we still indulge in controversies over curricula, school systems, college and university reforms, and shortages in the teaching professions, technological systems are being perfected which will make nonsense of all the adjustments we are now considering. The language laboratory and the closed-circuit TV are the only forerunners of a fully industrialized educational system that will make use of increasingly centralized programming and of recent advances in the study of learning. In that process, education will become a mass medium, the most powerful of all, and a billion-dollar business. Whether we realize it or not, the mind industry is growing faster than any other not excluding armament. It has become the key industry of the 20th century. Those who are concerned with the power game of today, political leaders, intelligence men, and revolutionaries, have very well grasped this crucial fact. Whenever an industrially developed country is occupied or liberated today, whenever there is a coup d'etat, a revolution, or a counter-revolution, the crack police units, the paratroopers, the guerrilla fighters no longer descend on the main squares of the city or seize the centers of heavy industry, as in the 19th century, or symbolic sites such as the royal palace. Instead, 
the new regime will take over, first of all, the radio and television stations, telephone and telex exchanges, and the printing presses. And after having entrenched itself, it will, by and large, leave alone those who manage the public services and the manufacturing industries, at least in the beginning, while all the functionaries who run the mine industry will be immediately replaced. In such extreme situations, the industry's key position becomes quite clear. There are four conditions which are necessary to its existence. Briefly, they are as follows. 1. Enlightenment, in the broadest sense, is the philosophical prerequisite of the industrialization of the mind. It cannot get underway until the rule of theocracy, and with it the people's faith in revelation and inspiration, in the holy book or the holy ghost as taught by the priesthood is broken. The mind industry presupposes independent minds, even when it is out to deprive them of their independence. This is another of its paradoxes. The last theocracy to vanish was Tibet's. Ever since, the philosophical condition has been met with throughout the world. 2. Politically, the industrialization of the mind presupposes the proclamation of human rights, of equality and liberty in particular. In Europe, this threshold was passed by the French Revolution, in the communist world by the October Revolution, and in America, Asia, and Africa by the wars of liberation from colonial rule. Obviously, the industry does not depend on the realization of these rights. For most people, they have never been more than a pretense or, at best, a distant promise. On the contrary, it is just the margin between fiction and reality that provides the mind industry with its theater of operations. Consciousness, both individual and social, has become a political issue only from the moment when the conviction arose in people's minds that everyone should have a say in his own destiny, as well as that of society at large. From the same moment, any authority had to justify itself in the eyes of those it would govern. Coercion alone would no longer do the trick. He who rules must persuade, lay claim to people's minds, and change them in an industrial age by every industrial means at hand. 3. Economically, the mind industry cannot come of age unless a measure of primary accumulation has been achieved. A society that cannot provide the necessary surplus capital neither needs it nor can afford it. During the first half of the 19th century in Western Europe, and under similar conditions in other parts of the world which prevailed until fairly recently, Peasants and workers lived at a level of bare subsistence. During this stage of economic development, the fiction that the working class is able to determine the conditions of its own existence is meaningless. The proletariat is subjected by physical constraint and undisguised force. Archaic methods of manipulation, as used by the school and the church, the law and the army, together with old customs and conventions, are quite sufficient for the ruling minority to maintain its position during the earlier stages of industrial development. As soon as the basic industries have been firmly established and the mass production of consumer goods is beginning to reach out to the majority of the population, the ruling classes will face a dilemma. More sophisticated methods of production demand a constantly rising standard of education, not only for the privileged but also for the masses. The immediate compulsion that kept the working class in its place will slowly decrease. Working hours are reduced and the standard of living rises. Inevitably, people will become aware of their own situation. They can now afford the luxury of having a mind of their own. For the first time, they become conscious of themselves in more than the most primitive and hazy sense of the word. In this process, enormous human energies are released, the energies that inevitably threaten the established political and economic order. Today, this revolutionary process can be seen at work in a great number of emergent nations, where it has long been artificially retarded by imperialist powers. In these countries, the political, if not the economic conditions for the development of mind industries can be realized overnight. 4. Given a certain level of economic development, industrialization brings with it the last condition for the rise of a mind industry, the technology on which it depends. The first industrial uses of electricity were concerned with power and not with communications. The dynamo and the electrical motor preceded the amplifying valve and the film camera. There are economic reasons for this time lag. The foundations of radio, film, recording, television, and computer technologies could not be laid before the advent of the mass production of commodities and the general availability of electrical power. 
In our time, the technological conditions for the industrialization of the mind exist anywhere on the planet. The same cannot be said for the political and economic prerequisites, however. It is only a matter of time until they will be met. The process is irreversible. Therefore, all criticism of the mind industry that is abolitionist, in its essence, is inept, and beside the point, since the idea of arresting and liquidating industrialization itself, which such criticism implies, is suicidal. There is a macabre irony to any such proposal, for it is indeed no longer a technical problem for our civilization to abolish itself. However, this is hardly what conservative critics have in mind when they complain about the loss of values, the depravity of mass civilization, and the degeneration of traditional culture by the media. The idea is, rather, to do away with all these nasty things and to survive as an elite of happy pundits amidst the nicer comforts offered by a country house. Nonetheless, the workings of the mind industry have been analyzed in part over and over again, sometimes with great ingenuity and insight. So far as the capitalist countries are concerned, the critics have leveled their attacks mainly against the newer media and commercial advertising. Conservatives and Marxists alike have been all too ready to deplore their venal side. It is an objection that hardly touches the heart of the matter, apart from the fact that it is perhaps no more immoral to profit from the mass production of news or symphonies than from that of soap and tires. Objections of this kind overlook the very characteristics of the mind industry. Its more advanced sectors have long since ceased to sell any goods at all. With increasing technological maturity, the material substrata, paper or plastic or celluloid, tend to vanish. Only in the more old-fashioned offshoots of the business, as for example in the book trade, does the commodity aspect of the product play an important economic role. In this respect, a radio station has nothing in common with a match factory. With the disappearance of the material substratum, the product becomes more and more abstract and the industry depends less and less on selling it to its customers. If you buy a book, you pay for it in terms of its real cost of production. If you pick up a magazine, you pay only a fraction thereof. If you tune in on a radio or television program, you get it virtually free. Direct advertising and political propaganda is something nobody buys. On the contrary, it is crammed down our throats. The products of the mind industry can no longer be understood in terms of a seller's and buyer's market, or in terms of production costs. They are, as it were, priceless. The capitalist exploitation of the media is accidental and not intrinsic. To concentrate on their commercialization is to miss the point, and to overlook the specific service the mind industry performs for modern societies. This service is essentially the same all over the world. No matter how the industry is operated, under state, public, or private management, within a capitalist or socialist economy, on a profit or non-profit basis, the mind industry's main business and concern is not to sell its product, it is to sell the existing order, to perpetuate the prevailing pattern of man's domination by man, no matter who runs the society, and no matter by what means. Its main task is to expand and train our consciousness in order to exploit it. Since immaterial exploitation is not a familiar concept, it might be well to explain its meaning. Classical Marxism has defined very clearly the material exploitation to which the working classes have been subjected ever since the Industrial Revolution. In its crudest form, it is the characteristic of the period of primary accumulation of capital. This holds true even for socialist countries, as it is evident from the example of Stalinist Russia and the early stages of the development of Red China. As soon as the bases of industrialization are laid, however, it becomes clear that material exploitation alone is insufficient to guarantee the continuity of the system. When the production of goods expands beyond the most immediate needs, the old proclamations of human rights, however watered down by the rhetoric of the establishment, and however eclipsed by decades of hardship, famine, crisis, forced labor, and political terror, will now unfold their potential strength. It is in their very nature that once proclaimed they cannot be revoked. Again and again, people will try to take them at their face value and eventually to fight for their realization. Thus, ever since the great declarations of the 18th century, every rule of the few over the many, however organized, has faced the threat of revolution. Real democracy, as opposed to the formal facades of parliamentary democracy, does not exist anywhere in the world, but its ghost haunts every existing regime.
Consequently, all the existing power structures must seek to obtain the consent, however passive, of their subjects. Even regimes that depend on the force of arms for their survival feel the need to justify themselves in the eyes of the world. Control of capital, of the means of production, and of the armed forces is therefore no longer enough. The self-appointed elites who run modern societies must try to control people's minds. What each of us accepts or rejects, what we think and decide is now, here as well as in Vietnam, a matter of prime political concern. It would be too dangerous to leave these matters to ourselves. Material exploitation must camouflage itself in order to survive. Immaterial exploitation has become its necessary corollary. The few cannot go on accumulating wealth unless they accumulate the power to manipulate the minds of the many. To expropriate manpower, they have to expropriate the brain. What is being abolished in today's affluent societies from Moscow to Los Angeles is not exploitation, but our awareness of it. It takes quite a lot of effort to maintain this state of affairs. There are alternatives to it, but since all of them would inevitably overthrow the prevailing powers, an entire industry is engaged in doing away with them, eliminating possible futures, and reinforcing the present pattern of domination. There are several ways to achieve this end. On the one hand, we find downright censorship, bans, and a state monopoly on all the means of production of the mind industry. On the other hand, economic pressures, systematic distribution of punishment and reward, and human engineering can do the job just as well, and much more smoothly. The material pauperization of the last century is followed and replaced by the immaterial pauperization of today. Its most obvious manifestation is the decline in political options available to the citizen of the most advanced nations. A mass of political nobodies, over whose heads even collective suicide can be decreed, is opposed by an ever-decreasing number of political moguls. That this state of affairs is readily accepted and voluntarily endured by the majority is the greatest achievement of the mind industry. To describe its effects on present-day society is not, however, to describe its essence. The emergence of the textile industry has ruined the craftsmen of India and caused widespread child labor in England. But these consequences do not necessarily follow from the existence of the mechanical loom. There is no more reason to suppose that the industrialization of the human mind must produce immaterial exploitation. It would even be fair to say that it will eventually, by its own logic, do away with the very results it has today, for this is the most fundamental of all its contradictions. In order to obtain consent, you have to grant a choice, no matter how marginal and deceptive, in order to harness the faculties of the human mind. You have to develop them, no matter how narrowly and how deformed. It may be a measure of the overwhelming power of the mind industry that none of us can escape its influence. Whether we like it or not, it enlists our participation in the system as a whole, but this participation may very well veer one day from the passive to the active and turn out to threaten the very order it was supposed to uphold. The mind industry has a dynamic of its own that it cannot arrest, and it is not by chance but by necessity that in this movement there are currents that run contrary to its present mission of stabilizing the status quo. A corollary of its dialectical progress is that the mind industry, however closely supervised in its individual operations, is never completely controllable as a whole. There are always leaks in it, cracks in the armor. No administration will ever trust it all the way. In order to exploit people's intellectual, moral, and political faculties, you have got to develop them first. This is, as we have seen, the basic dilemma faced by today's media. When we turn our attention from the industry's consumers to its producers, the intellectuals, we find this dilemma aggravated and intensified. In terms of power, of course, there can be no question as to who runs the business. Certainly it is not the intellectuals who control the industrial establishment, but the establishment that controls them. There is precious little chance for the people who are productive to take over their means of production. This is just what the present structure is designed to prevent. However, even under present circumstances, the relationship is not without a certain ambiguity, since there is no way of running the mind industry without enlisting the services of at least a minority of men who can create something 
to exclude them would be self-defeating. Of course, it is perfectly possible to use the whole stock of accumulated original work and have it adapted, diluted, and processed for media use. And it may be well to remember that much of what purports to be new is in fact derivative. If we examine the harmonic and melodic structure of any popular song, it will most likely turn out to employ inventions of serious composers of centuries ago. The same is true of the dramaturgical cliches of mediocre screenplays. Watered down beyond recognition, they repeat traditional patterns taken from the drama and the novel of the past. In the long run, however, the parasitic use of inherited work is not sufficient to nourish the industry. However large a stock, you cannot sell out forever without replenishment, hence the need to make it new. The media's dependence on men capable of innovation, in other words, on potential troublemakers. It is inherent in the process of creation that there is no way to predict its results. Consequently, intellectuals are, from the point of view of any power structure bent on its own perpetuation, a security risk. It takes consummate skill to handle them and to neutralize their subversive influence. All sorts of techniques, from the crudest to the most sophisticated, have been developed to this end. Physical threat, blacklisting, moral and economic pressure on the one hand, overexposure, co-optation into star cult or power elite on the other are the extremes of a whole gamut of manipulation. It would be worthwhile to write a manual analyzing these techniques. They have one thing in common. They offer short-term tactical answers to a problem that, in principle, cannot be resolved. This is an industry that has to rely as its primary source on the very minorities with whose elimination it is entrusted, those whose aim it is to invent and produce alternatives. Unless it succeeds in exploiting and manipulating its producers, the mind industry cannot hope to exploit and manipulate its consumers on the level of production even more than on the level of consumption. It has to deal with partners who are potential enemies. Engaged in the proliferation of human consciousness, the media proliferate their own contradictions. Criticism of the mind industry that fails to recognize its central ambiguities is either idle or dangerous. It is a measure of their limitations that many media critics never seem to reflect on their own position just as if their work were not itself part of what it criticizes. The truth is that nowadays, no one can express any opinion at all without making use of the industry, or rather, without being used by it. Anyone incapable of dialectical thinking is doomed as soon as he starts grappling with this subject. He will be trapped to a point where even retreat is no longer possible. There are many who feel revolted at the thought of entering a studio or negotiating with the slick executives who run the networks. They detest or profess to detest the very machinery of the industry and would like to withdraw into some abode of refinement. Of course, no such refuge really exists. The seemingly exclusive is just another slightly more expensive style within the same giant industrial combine. Let us rather try to draw the line between intellectual integrity and defeatism. To opt out of the mind industry, to refuse any dealings with it, may well turn out to be a reactionary course. There is no hermitage left for those whose job it is to speak out and to seek innovation. Retreat from the media will not even save the intellectual's precious soul from corruption. It might be a better idea to enter the dangerous game to take and calculate our risks. Instead of innocence, we need determination. We must know very precisely the monster we are dealing with, and we must be continually on our guard to resist the overt or subtle pressures that are brought to bear on us. The rapid development of the mind industry, its rise to a key position in modern society, has profoundly changed the role of the intellectual. He finds himself confronted with new threats and new opportunities. Whether he knows it or not, whether he likes it or not, he has become the accomplice of a huge industrial complex that depends for its survival on him, as he depends on it for his own. He must try at any cost to use it for his own purposes, which are incompatible with the purposes of the mind machine. What it upholds he must subvert. He may play it crooked or straight. He may win or lose the game. But he would do well to remember that there is more at stake than his own future.